internet connection sharing and internet connection firewall with Windows XP. So your boss tells you that you have to get five salespeople in a branch office uh, set up and configured on the internet as easily and inexpensively as possible. So how are you going to do this? Well, that's the main focus of this video. Let's bring up a whiteboard and talk about that. In this video, we're going to learn how to connect a small business or a small home network to the internet by sharing a connection on the internet from one computer which will allow all of our remaining Windows XP computers to pass through to also get to the internet. Once we've established this shared connection to the internet, we need to make sure we protect ourselves from uh, intruders on the internet and we'll do that by using the internet connection firewall. So let's kick this off and see how this all works. The process of actually enabling ICS is very easy. However, uh, we need to know more about what ICS is doing in the background in case uh, something ever goes wrong with our connections. So we're going to bring up another whiteboard here and talk about how ICS is actually enabled and configured. So let's do that now. So in this configuration, we have four Windows XP computers, three over here, one right here, that all need to get out to the Internet through one connection. So to meet this goal, what we're going to do is configure one Windows XP computer with a connection to the internet and it'll also have another connection to its private network. We talked about private networks in our TCP IP video. The connection to the internet can be a dial-up modem or it could be some type of high-speed connection such as a cable modem. The computer that will have the connection to the internet is referred to as an ICS host, an internet connection sharing host and the computers that will connect through the ICS host to the internet are referred to as client ICS computers. So our first step to uh, get our computer ready so we can enable ICS is to install a network device on the ICS host computer that will be used to connect to the internet. That network device could be our, our dial-up modem or it's going to be a network adapter that will be used to connect to some type of broadband connection and that will be our cable modem or an ADSL line or something to that effect. The second step is to install a network adapter that's going to be used to connect the ICS host computer to the private network where all of our ICS client computers are located. Once you've completed those two tasks, you'll enable internet connection sharing on the network device that's connected to the internet, not the private network, because we're trying to share our internet connection and if we uh, share ICS on our private network connection, that connection is not connected to the internet and we're going nowhere fast. So once we enable uh, ICS on our internet connection, a lot of things happen in the background. First off, ICS will configure the TCP IP address of the ICS host with a static IP address of 192.168.0.1 with a default subnet mask of 255.255.255.0. The IP address that uh, ICS statically assigned to our computer defines the network that we're on and that's always going to be 192.168.0 and that means that in order for our client computers to pass through the ICS host to get out to the internet they will also have to have an IP address configured to the same network. To get our client computers on the same network that our ICS host is on, the ICS host becomes a DHCP allocator, basically a mini DHCP server and the ICS host will provide IP addresses to the clients from this range of 192.168.0.2 all the way to 254. So that means we can have uh, up to 252 uh, ICS clients that can pass through the host to get out to the internet. To allow the client computers to obtain an IP address out of this range, we have to configure all these ICS client computers to obtain their IP address uh, automatically via DHCP. So that means when you're configuring an ICS host on a small network, make sure you have not installed an actual DHCP server on this network as well because that could potentially prevent the clients from uh, getting to the internet because they'll have conflicting IP addresses or incorrect IP addresses that might get assigned to them from the DHCP server. Once ICS has been enabled and the client computers have an IP address from this range, the client computers are able to find the ICS host because the ICS host will advertise its shared connection to all these client computers on the network with a broadcast 
meaning that it basically shouts out to everybody, hey, I'm sharing a connection, come and get it. And the other Windows XP computers will hear this broadcast and an ICS icon will automatically appear in the network connections folder on the client computers. So those are the steps that are required to uh, configure your ICS host so you can share its internet connection and the steps for uh, configuring our client computers. Let's uh, actually enable ICS and see how it works. So to enable uh, ICS on our adapter we have to open the network connections folder and we can do that by clicking on start. Choose control panel and within control panel locate network connections. Double click network connections and here we are. So in our example we're using uh, local area connection 5 to connect to the private network and local area connection 6 is a high speed connection to the internet through a cable modem and we can rename the connections to take the guesswork out of uh, knowing which connection is internet and which connection is private so I'm going to do that right now we'll just select uh, local area 5 press the F2 key to rename and let's call this maybe our home connection and let's select local area 6 call this internet okay so who can tell me which adapter we enable ICS on was it the home or the internet Okay, Frank says internet, Frank wins. Okay, so we just double click on internet, click on properties, and from internet properties we click on the advanced tab, and from here we go to the internet connection sharing option, and to enable this it's as easy as clicking on this option, allow other network users to connect through this computer's internet connection. This option can be a little bit of a gotcha. When we enable internet connection sharing on our ICS host computer, the ICS client computers will automatically add an icon called Internet Gateway to their network connections folder and from the properties of the Internet Gateway icon they can view and monitor the status of the shared uh, internet connection on our ICS host computer but with this option enabled they can also disable the shared internet connection sharing on our ICS host computer and that will be disabled for every single uh, ICS client computer on our private network so not a good thing here so watch out for this option I'm gonna leave this option enabled though purely for demonstration purposes so kids don't try this at home let's close out of here now I'm gonna click on OK and IC ICS should be assigning the static IP address of 192.168.0.1 to our home adapter now so now that ICS has been enabled our network adapter for the internet is telling us that ICS has been enabled, enabled comma share. Uh, also we see this little shared hand underneath our network adapter. Our uh, home connection should have been assigned our static IP address by ICS. Let's double check that. We'll just double click on our home network, click on support, and we see that our IP address of 192.168.0.1 has been manually or statically configured uh, to this adapter. So we're all good to go there. Now that we've uh, confirmed that our ICS host is up and running, let's uh, make sure that our ICS clients can uh, get out to the internet. To do that, I've established a remote desktop connection to an ICS client called Nugget2, and that's minimized down on the taskbar. Let's bring that up now. We talk about remote desktop uh, connections in our remote desktop video in the series. So first off, let's take a look at our network adapter. To do that, we're going to click on Start, go to our Control Panel, and then click on double click on network connections and here we go first let's check to see if the DHCP allocator on the ICS host has provided our client with an IP address to do that we'll just double click on our local area connection and click on the support tab and we've got an IP address from the correct network we've got an IP address 192.168.0.135 which allows us to get through our ICS host at 192.168.0.1 to the internet. So, so far so good. Let's close out of here. The internet gateway icon shows us the network uh, device that ICS was enabled on on the ICS host computer. So we see in this example that our network adapter internet which was enabled on our host computer Nugget1 is acting as our gateway for this client out to the internet and if we double click on this icon we can monitor activity for our gateway and see how long the gateway has been up, our network uh, connection to that gateway. 
If you want to be able to quickly get to this Internet Gateway uh, property page, we can enable the Internet Gateway icon in the notification area as I've done right here in the bottom right hand corner. And that's done by clicking on properties and then click on this option, show icon in notification area when connected. The settings button will allow us to configure our ICS host computer to allow inbound connections from the internet to go to specific ICS uh, computers in our uh, ICS network. So for example, if our small branch office was hosting a web server on a Windows XP computer for their little uh, uh, home page that they might have, in order for users from the internet to see that home page, we'd have to enable uh, this option right here, Web Server HTTP, which will allow uh, connections to our internal web server. We'll talk more about this uh, functionality in a moment here. Uh, let's close out of here and then click on OK. The last button that I want to talk about here is the Disable button. When we enabled ICS on our host computer, that also enabled the option to allow other network users to control or disable the shared internet connection. And what that means is that any ICS client can click on the disable button to turn off the internet gateway for every ICS user. So I would recommend against enabling that feature on the ICS host to ensure that your internet gateway is always up and running. So let's close out of here. Let's put our internet gateway to test and see if our client can connect to the internet. We'll just fire up our web browser. So we'll click on start, choose Internet Explorer, one, two, three, boom, we're on the internet. Now this raises a question though, how was our web browser able to resolve www.cbtnuggets.com to its IP address? How were we able to do DNS resolution if we don't have a DNS server? Well, to answer that question, let's uh, go back to our ICS host computer. So we're going to close out of here. When we enabled ICS on our host computer, that enabled the DHCP allocator that we talked about, but it also enables two other services. Let's bring up a whiteboard and talk about that. In addition to being a DHCP allocator, the ICS host will help ICS clients perform DNS name resolution by forwarding DNS name requests to DNS servers on the internet, typically your internet service provider's DNS servers. The other service that uh, an ICS host will provide is Network Address Translation, or NAT for short. Uh, what NAT does for a living is that it allows multiple computers on a private network, such as this right here, to share a single connection to the Internet. So this is really the key piece of the ICS puzzle to allow our ICS clients to get out through uh, the host to the Internet. To understand how we can allow connection requests that which originate from the Internet, into our private network to connect to maybe a web server that we might have running. We need to talk about two other things here. We need to talk about ports and we need to talk about NAT a little more uh, fully here. Let's talk about our ports first. We're going to bring up another whiteboard. When Windows XP is running on a TCP IP network, it's the responsibility of the IP protocol to send data from our computer to the correct destination computer. But how does IP know once it's reached that correct destination computer, which service running on the computer should actually get the data? Well, the answer to that is services use unique TCP port numbers, which uniquely identifies services from each other. A port number is referred to as an endpoint in communication. Once I've reached that computer, what is the endpoint? Where do I send this data to now? For example, if we fire up our web browser on our computer and we want to connect to a web server out on the internet, we send our data to that server, but then once the data re reaches that server, it's going to be sent to port 80 to be transmitted to the actual web server. This is kind of like uh, going to a restaurant where the table that you sit at might be number 10, and the person who delivers your food to you isn't the same person who took your order, but they can deliver the food to you because the order states the food goes to table 10 and the server knows where table 10 is and the end result is get you get your food. There are 65,536 ports available to services out of which uh, 1,024 ports have been pre-assigned to uh, services such as FTP and our web servers and these are referred to as well-known ports and we can see a listing of these well-known ports in this uh, file location right here. Let's take a look at that right now. 
So to get to the services file that we need, we have to go through Windows System32 Drivers Etsy. So to do that, we're going to click on Start, My Computer, double click our C partition, find Windows, find System32, which is right here. And in System32, we're looking for the Drivers folder, which is right here. And now we're looking for etc. Here we go. And in etc., we're going to double click on services and we can open this up with a notepad application. Just click on OK. Select notepad and then okie dokie. And this file is placed here during the installation phase. There's nothing you have to do to get this file. And as I mentioned, it lists the well known ports used by services that might be running on your computer. Uh, typical ports such as FTP, uh, Telnet port number 23, SMTP, uh, web server port should be listed here as well for HTTP, so on and so forth. So it's just uh, tucked right inside this directory for your perusal. Let's close out of here and get back to our um, whiteboard. Ports are a uh, key component in how uh, the network address translation gets our data from our private network out to the internet and then back. Let's take a look at that now. I'll bring up another whiteboard and that's right here. So in this scenario we have an ICS client at the IP address of 192.168.0.2, the source IP address, who is communicating on port 3120, who wants to get to a web server out on the internet at IP address of 157.65.43.8, which is our destination location and it's trying to get to port 80 on that web server. So the ICS client is going to send this information to our ICS host and the ICS host running NAT will perform a little smoke and mirrors in the background. Because the IP address of the client of 192.168.0.2 can't be sent out to the internet, what NAT is going to do is it's going to substitute its IP address from the network adapter that is connected to the internet in replace of the IP address of the client computer. And it does that by maintaining a port mapping table. This table has a mapping of the outgoing request information from this IP address to this destination and their ports to marry that information to this IP address and this port number on the network adapter that's facing the internet. So with that information in place on the ICS host computer, it's then going to basically forward that request on behalf of the client to the destination computer on the internet. That destination computer then gets the request, sends it back to the ICS host, and this is referred to as an inbound connection. And before the ICS host allows an inbound connection, what it's going to do is, what NAT is going to do is look at its port mapping table and it's going to see have I made an entry in my table for uh, this request and it's going to see that yes I did I have an entry of 157.65.43.8 on a port of uh, 4100 and that's supposed to go to uh, this IP address at this port number so it gets that information, looks in its table, determines where that information should go to, and then sends that information to the correct ICS client. So that means that all connection requests uh, coming in from the internet trying to hit NAT on the ICS host have to originate from within our private network here because that t creates the table mapping. So all inbound traffic from the internet is compared against entries in this table. If there's no entry made in this table as a result of an outbound request from an ICS client, this guy is not coming in at all. That means that if we have a web server that's running on our internal private network, a uh, request from the internet to that internal web server will be denied because there's no uh, port mapping to that internal web server within our table here. So to work around that, we're going to have to manually configure a port mapping on our ICS host. And it's very easy to do that. Let's take a look at that now. We'll just uh, dive down to our network connections, which is minimized down here. Bring that up. Manual port mappings are configured on the internet adapter. So we just double click on this adapter, 
click on properties from here we click on the advanced tab and then from here we go to the bottom right hand corner and click on settings and this tab shows a listing of uh, common network services that we might have running on our network that we'd like to create a manual port mapping for so if we wanted to uh, create a mapping for our web server we would scroll down in the bottom choose this option and then we'd have to tell NAT when it gets the inbound request where should it submit that request to and we can use the host name of the web server or the IP address of the web server so I'm just going to leave it with the host name there click on OK and then uh, you just click on OK and that would be it so now all inbound requests for port 80 would be made to uh, the computer nugget one that completes our look at uh, configuring and customizing our ICS connection. However, what we've done with our connection is exposed ourselves to the Internet. What we need to do now is protect ourselves from intruders uh, from the Internet gaining access to our private network. The port mapping used by Network Address Translation in ICS does a very good job of protecting our clients from uh, most type of intruder traffic. However, it's not able to uh, protect against all attacks. The Internet Connection Firewall also uses a port uh, mapping mechanism to determine if inbound connections should be allowed uh, into our private network, but it goes one step further and it provides a stateful firewall protection, uh, meaning that it's going to monitor all aspects of network traffic that's going to cross its path and inspect everything, whereas NAT uh, only expect, inspects a partial amount of uh, network traffic. Uh, for example, the NAT could be the equivalent of having your car mechanic perform a 24-point uh, safety inspection of your car, whereas uh, the Internet Connection Firewall would be a 124-point inspection, and it's going to check everything under the hood. So in order to enable this protection of Internet Connection Firewall, all we have to do is click on this option, click on OK, it's doing its thing, and then we click on Close. And if you notice now, our network adapter that's pointing to the Internet now has a little lock on it, indicating that the firewall functionality has been enabled, and we can see right here that we have been firewalled. ICF has some uh, custom features that we can use to enable a log file to view firewall activity, and we can turn off ICMP requests to uh, prevent computers on the Internet from detecting our computer. To view those options, we just uh, double-click on our Internet adapter, so let's do that now go to the properties of this adapter click on the advanced tab and then from here in the bottom right hand corner click on the settings button so if you notice we're at the same tab we're at just a moment ago when we enabled our manual port mapping for a web server and what happens is that ICF and ICS will uh, share resources such as our manual port mappings they also share uh, the same uh, mapping table as well but what ICF brought to the table was that it added these two tabs here, security logging and ICMP. Let's take a look at security logging. This option, uh, log drop packets, will record all connection attempts that have been denied by the firewall. So this is a good option to enable if you want to see if uh, people are trying to hack into your firewall to get to your systems. In contrast, the log successful connections option is going to log every single successful connection that goes through the firewall. So that means uh, if one of your ICS clients is able to uh, connect to a website out in the internet, it's going to log that information. So needless to say, your firewall can reach its uh, limit here very, very quickly if you have that option enabled. So you may want to uh, consider deselecting that option. Let's go to our last tab, ICMP. The Internet Control Message Protocol is the housekeeping protocol for the TCPIP suite of protocols. It's an error and correction detection protocol and it's going to report errors in delivery of uh, IP packets. Uh, for example, uh, it's going to report an error if the destination host is unreachable. Uh, also, if we issue the ping command, it's going to send an ICMP echo request to the destination computer. So if we have these ICMP options enabled our computer can become visible to the internet and thus make our computer vulnerable to attacks uh, from the internet and as you see here these options are disabled as a default so we'll leave those disabled here as our best practice let's uh, close out of here and take a look at our uh, logging file so we'll click on OK click on OK it's going to and click on close 
and our logging file is located in our Windows directory so we get to that by clicking on start choose my computer go to our C partition go to our Windows directory and within our Windows directory we're looking for the file called pfirewall.log and that should be right here so let's double click on that so let's just maximize this make it a little easier to see here and because we had enabled uh, both uh, log drop packets and log successful connections we've got a fair amount of information here so we see uh, and uh, this area right here fields uh, tells us which each of these fields are here so the date the time the action so here's the date the time the action the protocol that was used then SRC is the source IP address and then the destination IP address and port that we're trying to get to uh, so we see here that uh, our computer was trying to on behalf of an ICS client get to a web server uh, located at this IP address at that port number so let's see if uh, anybody's trying to hack into our system let's see if we can find any drop packets and holy cow just in the few minutes that we had our uh, far up far wall up and running here we have somebody at uh, this IP address right here is trying to connect to our system uh, not a good thing so it's good that we did put our firewall up and now that we have our firewall up and we're uh, logging our drop packets that brings us to the end of this video ladies and gentlemen so we're gonna close out of here and let's do a little recap of what we covered here we're gonna bring up our whiteboard so in this video we saw that in order to configure a a computer to be an ICS host that computer has to have uh, two network devices one that's connected to the private network and one that's connected to the internet and we enable ICS on the device that's connected to the internet and then all we have to do to configure the ICS client is just to make sure it's obtaining an IP address automatically from the DHCP server and then the ICS host provides uh, uh, the DHCP allocator NAT and DNS proxy service to allow our ICS clients to be able to cruise the internet and we finished off our ICS discussion by seeing how we can create a manual port mapping to allow requests that originate from the internet to go through our NAT into our private network and then we saw how we can secure our private network by enabling the internet connection firewall and how to enable the logging features uh, that are available uh, for that firewall and with that, ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to the end. I hope this video has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.